Welcome today. Good morning to our Sunday worship service here at St. Paul's Christian Church in Raleigh. We want to thank you for joining us on our Facebook live stream. And if you're a guest, we, we appreciate you, you being with us virtually. Thanks for clicking in. Today's message is about preparing for the future. We're going into the wilderness. But how do we prepare when we're not sure what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month? Before we step into that future, let us calm our minds, still our thoughts, ready our hearts. Let us pray. O oh, wise and wondrous creator, we come to you today humbly, in need of wisdom, guidance, grace, love, and patience. When the well runs dry, you show us the way to everlasting water. When the skies darken and fear swirls around us, you bring us a calm we did not think was possible. When we feel lost or anxious or worried about what comes next in our lives, the plight of loved ones, the uncertainty of a job, the anger and pain inflicted by injustice, racism, natural disasters, politics, privilege, we open ourselves to you, the one who brings the light of the world, the love that is eternal, the one who taught us to pray. And let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, St. Paul's. Before we enter into a time of prayer, I wanted to remind our parents and young kids that Kelsey Law recorded a special children's moment for you this morning. This children's moment is longer than usual, so we have uploaded it to our YouTube page for kids to watch whenever they have the chance. We have also included a direct link to this video um, in the description of the Facebook Live. As we prepare our hearts and minds to pray for our church and world, I invite you to take a moment of silence, to settle into our bodies, becoming ever more aware of God's presence with us. Loving God, we settle into another morning with you. Another morning of virtual worship from our kitchen tables and living rooms. God, some of us are feeling weary from the week, weary from the state of the world. Some of us are feeling a deep loneliness. We weren't created for such isolation. Some of us are full of excitement as we anticipate new life arriving at any moment. Others would give anything for a moment of stillness and silence, free of any demands or expectations. Wherever we are today, compassionate God, meet us there. We continue to pray for our neighbors along the West Coast who are suffering from devastating wildfires. For families and the elderly, 
who have left their homes unsure of what will remain when they return. And for the officials and volunteers who are attempting to provide safety, not only from the fires, but also from the looming presence of COVID-19. God, when destruction is all around us, guide us into moments of peace and rest. This past week, many of us paused to remember the pain and tragedy of September 11th, 2001. We hold the pain and grief of families and communities whose lives were forever changed. And we give thanks for the first responders who put the lives of others ahead of their own. In moments of tragedy and loss, may we turn to empathy and compassion rather than scapegoating and fear. In moments of weariness, may we turn to deep and abiding rest instead of the idolatry of productivity. O oh God, for those suffering around the world, and for those of us worshiping in our homes, you know exactly what we need. Continue to meet us with love, mercy, and kindness, that we may extend that same love, mercy, and kindness to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, this is not a disciple's table. This is the Lord's table, and the Lord invites us to share this meal. In Luke 13, we read, 
from east and west, from north and south, people will come and take their places at the banquet in the kingdom of God. So we come to the table not because we understand, but because we are understood. Not because we deserve a place, but because Jesus invites us. Please pray with us. Almighty and everlasting God, bless this bread and wine, creating us a new and contrite heart so that we can acknowledge our brokenness. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, you reconcile your people to yourself. Through your sacrifice, you have granted us perfect remission and forgiveness. May we obey you with willing hearts and serve one another in love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gathered at a table with the disciples, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Every time you eat this, do it in remembrance of me. And then Jesus took the cup that was on the table and blessed it and said, this is my love poured out for you, so that no matter what happens, you may know I am always with you. Every time you drink this cup, remember me. Now, having been connected by receiving these gifts wherever we are, let us pray together. Lord, we have tasted and seen your goodness around us this week. In each breath that we take, in each bite that we eat, in each connection with another person that reminds us we are not alone. Let every good thing in our lives remind us of you, generous God. Let every challenge we face draw us closer to you. Let every joy move us to share your goodness with those around us. And let every struggle make us more compassionate and more connected. Though we don't know what tomorrow will bring, we ask that you allow us to serve you, to share your love, and to give of ourselves, trusting that you will bless whatever we offer. Amen. Until I 
answered the call to seminary in 2005, but I still uh, have fond memories of my childhood with you and uh, consider St. Paul's my home, so I'm glad to be with you virtually today. Um, I'm going to be reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verses 14 through 17, and then skipping down to verses 24 through 28. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a solemn assembly, and on the seventh day a solemn assembly. No work shall be done on those days, only what everyone must eat, that alone may be prepared for you. You shall observe the festival of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your companies out of the land of Egypt. You shall observe this day throughout your generations as a perpetual ordinance. You shall observe this rite as a perpetual ordinance for you and your children. When you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this observance. And when, when your children ask you, what do you mean by this observance? You shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, for he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites went and did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. We begin a new series today called Wilderness Time Freedom People about remembering who we are in times of uncertainty, at times when it feels like we are wandering in the wilderness, in between a past that has been interrupted and an unknown future. Like the Israelites wandering in the desert with Moses, we might find that times like this make us feel weary and frustrated. But they can also be times of great growth and discovery. When we leave behind our former ways and habits that have kept us from flourishing like God intended. And learn how to trust and to follow God more fully. We come to better understand who we are and who God is in these liminal seasons, when we've left the familiar behind us, but haven't yet reached our desired destination. And so in that spirit, I invite you on a journey into the wilderness for the next six weeks. I hope that we'll be open to discovering what lessons we can learn from the stories of Exodus, as well as from other guides who have traveled this path before us. As many of you know, my husband Michael and I love to hike. We are refreshed when we spend time walking in the trees, absorbing the beauty of creation. Even for a short day hike, we normally pack a backpack filled with supplies. Water bottles, of course, and snacks, sunscreen and bug spray, a first aid kit, I usually like to take my GPS watch so that we know how far we've gone. And Michael always carries a journal and at least a guidebook or two about the wildflowers or the birds. We like to be prepared for whatever we might encounter when we venture out into the wilderness. The Israelites are preparing to leave slavery behind and to follow Moses into the wilderness in our scripture today. 
They are not yet free from Pharaoh. But God gives them very specific instructions about how they are supposed to celebrate a new holiday commemorating their escape. That's right, the very first Passover, which is meant to help the people remember how God set them free, actually takes place before they even leave Egypt. This seems like a strange way to begin. I mean, there was no Christmas before Jesus was born. No one celebrated Easter before Jesus' resurrection. We don't mark anniversaries before a wedding takes place or host a housewarming party before we even move into our new house. So why establish holiday traditions before the thing we celebrate even happens? I think it is because our celebrations tell a story, one that helps to teach us who we are and what we value and prepares us for our future. God is giving the Israelites a practice that they can carry with them into the wilderness to help them remember how God protects them from danger. This festival prepares them to be people who have been set free by God. When they are afraid and wonder if God is still with them in the desert over the next 40 years, They can look back and tell their children this story about how God helped them escape from mighty Pharaoh. When they start feeling tempted to return to the security of bondage, this festival will remind them that their identity is rooted in the freedom that was secured for them by God. Whenever they smell roasting lamb or eat unleavened bread, their senses of taste and smell will imprint the lessons on their hearts. The story of God leading them to freedom will be woven into the rhythm of their lives, a message that they tell and retell over and over again. Even generations later, when they face another exodus from the promised land into Babylonian captivity and wonder if God is going to save them, At least once a year, they will be in the habit of telling their children this story about how God led them to freedom before. Sitting around a table in the upper room, knowing the fear and danger that lies ahead, Jesus will tell his disciples this very same story about how God always saves over the Passover meal so that the disciples can hold on to hope after he's gone. In another land, their descendants hiding from the Nazis will whisper this lesson to a new generation, proclaiming the story of how God saves God's people even before we know how things will turn out. Whenever we fear what the future holds, whenever we start to wonder if God is with us through the hard and uncertain times, we turn to the traditions that have been passed on to us to help us remember who we are and how we have made it through before. And so God gave the Israelites a practice to hold on to, to prepare them to face the unknown. God tells them the end of the story before they have even set out. Jesus does this too, just before he is arrested. In fact, during their celebration of this very same Passover feast, Jesus gives his followers a new story, a new celebration, a new ritual of remembering how God saves that celebrates what Jesus is about to do for them. Jesus takes the bread they're eating and tells them it's his body broken for them, even though he is still sitting in front of them alive and well. He takes the cup of wine on the table and tells them it it is his blood spilled on their behalf, even though they have no idea what is about to take place. Jesus tells the disciples to tell and retell his story of how the bread and wine are reminders 
of his sacrificial love and unconditional forgiveness every time they eat and drink it from then on, even though they don't fully understand it yet. But we understand, we remember it has so much meaning for us 2,000 years later that we still tell that same story. We still eat and drink that bread and cup every week. The stories we tell and the rituals that we celebrate keep us grounded in who we are. They anchor us when we feel lost. They prepare us for a future that we can't yet see. I think that is why we have found ways to keep worshiping together, even though it looks very different, while we can't be under the same roof. That's why we teach Bible stories to our children through Vacation Bible School and Worship and Wonder, and find ways to keep telling them, no matter what else changes around us. Those stories are how we make sure our children know that God will always be with them, that they can always turn to God for help, that they are always loved and forgiven. And when we tell those stories to our children, it's a chance for us to remember them too. A chance for us to find sustenance when we are weary. Even when we are lost in the wilderness, we can remember where we belong. We can know that we are loved. Michael was backpacking on the Appalachian Trail a few years ago in the middle of a nasty storm. He hiked through a cold rain and got soaking wet and was just miserable. One night he was huddled in the shelter with the wind howling outside and wet socks and wet everything. And this is my favorite part of the story. He says that what brought him comfort in that moment was thinking about me and the times that we had shared together. Now, we had broken up several months before that and gone our separate ways. But out in the middle of the wilderness... He realized that what he wanted more than dry socks or a hot bowl of chili was to reconnect. Thinking back on the holidays we had celebrated, the trips we had taken, the stories and experiences that connected us was what encouraged him to push through to the end of the trail. And so he got off the trail and called me up, and less than a year later, we were married. No amount of snacks or sunscreen, no amount of packing or planning can fully prepare us for the challenges we might face in the wilderness. What provides us hope and encouragement when we feel lost is knowing that we are not alone, that we are surrounded by a sustaining love that will see us through whatever lies ahead. Many of us might feel like we're navigating our own wilderness journey right now through a pandemic with an unknown timeline and outcome, through a transformational time of wrestling with our country's history of racial inequalities, through a divisive political season filled with violent confrontations and misinformation through devastating ecological damage and recurring natural disasters, through a disrupted school year, and perhaps other personal challenges that you're facing too. It may seem like so much is out of our control, that there is no way for us to prepare for what lies ahead when we don't know what the future holds. But we have been prepared for this season of uncertainty through those practices that remind us who we are, that we can keep going back to again and again. Worship, prayer, communion, times of fellowship sustain us, whether they happen by video, Zoom, outdoors, or at home. We have those stories of how God loves us, and has protected us before, our experiences of God's presence in our lives that we can turn to and retell. We can read them again and maybe get new insights into God's remarkable care for God's people 
in light of our current experience. We have marked this unpredictable year with the predictable celebrations of Easter and Pentecost and Sabbath. And in a few months, we will celebrate Christ's birth. Our holidays may look very different this year, but what really matters is that meaning underlying in them reminding us that we are loved and cared for, that God always shows up. And maybe that meaning becomes even more clear this year as we let go of all the usual things that distract us from what is, lies at the heart of those celebrations. So let us keep telling the story of God's love and protection for the oppressed and the vulnerable and the lost. Let us eat the bread that reminds us that God is with those who are broken. And drink the wine that is a sign of God's extravagant love and mercy. And may these practices prepare us to keep seeking freedom for all people to never give up on God's work of liberation, even when the outcome is unknown. Because we know that God has done it before.
We are thankful that you joined us for this morning of virtual worship, um, and we hope you will find another way to connect with our community throughout the week. This afternoon, there are a variety of outdoor activities taking place on the church grounds. From 3 to 5 p.m., we're having our annual flu shot clinic. Um, due to COVID-19, signups are required ahead of time, and I think we only have three slots left. So if you're wanting to get your flu shot, um, please reach out to Diane and I to see if one of those times works for you. And then at 6 p.m., we will gather for another outdoor um, fellowship time uh, as a, having a tailgate, far, tailgate party as football season kicks off. So Ross Sinotis will be cooking some hamburgers and hot dogs for everyone. Um, and folks are invited to bring their own favorite condiments, sides, drinks, as well as masks and chairs for a time of uh, social distancing fun. We will have some games for adults and kids, including a limbo contest and hula hoop contest. So we hope you will join us from six to eight tonight for a time of fun and fellowship. This Tuesday, St. Paul's Book Club has their monthly meeting at 7 p.m. on Zoom. This is kind of a combined book club with our Walk the Talk series as everyone was encouraged to read a book on racial justice by a black author. So if you've done that, we hope that you will join our discussion this Tuesday at 7 p.m. Um, and we'll make sure to send out that Zoom link to our email list. Finally, you've probably heard about the visioning groups that will begin this fall. These groups will provide an intentional space of prayer, discussion, and discernment about the future of St. Paul's. Um, so we're actually taking a break from our Wednesday night Bible study to encourage folks to participate in these small groups. So if you haven't done so already, please fill out the survey and let us know if you would prefer to be in a group that's meeting on Zoom, um, over the phone, or outdoors in person. Um, and that way we can begin to form those groups um, as we hope to start those in a couple of weeks. And now you're invited to join me in the reading of our communal benediction that you will see on your screen. May the Lord go in front of you by day to lead you along the way. May God give you light by night and never leave you. In steadfast love, may God guide you through the wilderness. Amen. <laughs> 